afternoon. Welcome to our lecture program. I am Kostas Janos, Vice President and Chair of the Program Committee of Hellenic Link Midwest. Before introducing our speaker, I would like to say a few words about our next event. On Sunday, April 21, 2024, at 3 p.m. Chicago time, we will present Professor George Anagnostou in a lecture titled Toil and Rage in a New Land, Greek Immigrants in the U.S. Mining Industry, 1919-24. This is going to be a live lecture, which is going to be held at the Hotel Four Points by Sheraton at Cedar Park, at the southwest corner of uh, Irving Park Road at Menheim Road, close to the O'Hara Airport. This lecture will be supported by the Hellenic Foundation Chicago. Mm -hmm. Our speaker this afternoon is Dr. Nikos Nikoloudis, who joined us from Athens, Greece. Dr. Nikoloudis holds a doctorate degree from the Center of Byzantine and Modern Greek Studies at King's College, London. He has taught history courses at the college here in Athens, the Athens School for Tourist Guides, and the YWCA. He has also taught at postgraduate seminars at the Athens Institute for Education and Research. His area of research interests includes military and socio-political history in medieval and modern Greece, in South and Eastern Europe, the Middle East, and the Mediterranean. He has served as editor-in-chief of the General Historical Themata. He has co-authored two textbooks for the Hellenic Open University, and has published another 13 books and many articles. As always, always, as always we will close the lecture with a questions and answer session. You can type your questions at any time by clicking on the Q&A button, at the, I'm sorry, the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of the screen. This will open a screen where you can type your questions. Those who attend the event on Facebook, they can type their questions on the comment box on the left or at the right bottom of the screen. Dr. Nicoludis, the screen is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Janos, and I would like to thank uh, the Hellenic Link uh, Midwest as a whole for inviting me once again to your uh, interesting series of uh, lectures. Um, today's subject uh, is entitled The Promotion in the West of the Greek Struggle for Independence from 1821 to 1827. Um, it's a very wide topic, and um, for the sake of time and uh, better understanding, I've decided to somewhat narrow it down by uh, specializing it in, in the field of the contribution of Greek networks, uh, as stated in the subtitle. Um, and by that, I mean uh, networks of Greeks working abroad in uh, uh, in the West, in Western Europe mainly, uh, which contributed to the uh, promotion of uh, the Greek cause, especially in the early uh, years of the Greek Revolution from the beginning and for the next two or three years, uh, with um, a few references to later events. But it, the issue is too uh, wide to cover in an hour or so, or even less. So the uh, Hopefully, if uh, there is interest from the audience, uh, we, we could uh, I could answer questions uh, on the basis of uh, my presentation afterwards. So, uh, to st I'll start by giving a general idea of the political uh, climate and situation in the post-Napoleonic Europe. Uh, as we know, in June 1815, Napoleon was finally defeated Waterloo. And this event marked the return of the old authoritarian regimes in continental Europe. Uh, as a result, the republican ideas which had uh, 
spread out since the early days of the French Revolution uh, and freedom of speech were ended up being tolerated in just a handful of European states. And uh, namely, th those were England, Switzerland, the constitutional monarchies of Württemberg, Bavaria in Germany and the Netherlands. There were another two democracies uh, beyond uh, <clears throat> the European continent, uh, that is the United States of America since 1783 and Haiti since 1803. Essentially, the, uh, for the organizations in charge of uh, uh, European politics uh, at the time were the Second Quadruple Alliance, which was a political military alliance, and the Holy Alliance. They were both formed in 1815 before the Battle of Waterloo. Uh, the Second Quadruple um, Alliance, consisting of Great Britain, Austria, Prussia, and Russia, the four powers that uh, defeated Napoleon, and the Holy Alliance, which more, uh, which was more ideologically motivated, uh, consisted of Austria, Russia, and Prussia. That is uh, three out of the four of the Quadruple Alliance. Uh, their aim being uh, the protection of Christian values and God-given rights of sovereign monarchs. In any case, though, both um, <clears throat> alliances were orchestrated uh, and manipulated by the Austrian Chancellor Clemens von Metternich. The joint aims of these alliances uh, were to enforce the peace settlement as arranged by the Congress of Vienna, um, which was characterized by the predominance of conservative ideas, and to suppress liberal movements appearing to threaten established political order in Europe. Uh, just a quick uh, reminder of how the Greek Revolution started in this uh, set of circumstances. Um, on the 22nd of February, 1821, old style, Alexander Sipsilandis, a general in the Russian army and aide de camp to Tsar Alexander I, crossed the river Pruth, which was the border between the uh, Russian Empire in the Ottoman uh, provinces of uh, uh, Moldavia and Wallachia, the so-called Danuvian principalities, and entered uh, these principalities, which were semi-autonomous uh, and uh, populated by a large number of Greeks. Uh, the main this, this was a decoy, though. The main uh, events of the revolutions of the revolution were to take place in uh, Greece, as such. And there, the revolution started approximately a month later. I'm not giving the specific date of the 25th of March, which is the traditionally acknowledged uh, date as the beginning of the revolution, because in the Peloponnese, where the whole thing started, uh, Greeks had already started taking arms in various places before the 25th. And that the, those were Mani, Calavrita in the north, Kalamata in the southwest, and so on. Uh, what was the initial perception in Europe of the Greek struggle? Um, the Greek uh, revolution, which, uh, as many of us know, was instigated by the clandestine activities of the Philiki Eteria, a secret uh, political society, was seen first as a threat to political stability in southeastern Europe, despite the fact that the Ottoman Empire was not, in any sense, a member of the Holy Alliance. It was also seen as an offshoot of uh, simultaneous liberal movements which had started in other parts of Europe. And those were essentially the Carbonari uprisings in Italy in 1820 and 21, and the so-called uh, Triennio Liberal uh, in Spain, which was a three year constitutional uh, interview, interval, if you like, in the period between 1820 and 23, when it was eventually suppressed uh, by an invasion of French uh, forces. So in this context, um, newspapers, major European newspapers, uh, started commenting very negatively on the Greek revolution. I'll start with uh, some comments from French newspaper newspapers. The first was uh, the La Gazette de France, uh, which commented on the Philiki Eteria on the 4th of April, by characterizing it, by calling it rather a secret society following the Masonic model of political organization. A few months later, another newspaper, Le Journal de Debat, uh, said uh, the, wrote the following uh, on the 21st of September, 
uh, about the Greek Revolution. Those punished for their rebellion, including the Greek patriarch who had already been uh, <clears throat> killed by the Turkish authorities, and other clergymen, suffered nothing more than the punishment they deserved. The most hostile views were expressed by the, an Austrian newspaper, the Österreichische Beobachter, uh, which translates as Austrian Observer, uh, and uh, which was a semi-formal instrument of Metternich. <clears throat> this um, newspaper tried uh, repeatedly to undermine the growing philhellenic movement in continental Europe, and in a very significant publication on the 7th of June in 1821, just a couple of months really, after the outbreak of the revolution, uh, Friedrich von Gentz, who was its ghost's chief editor and a close associate of Metternich, as well as a uh, well-known com political commentator of the period, attempted to re deconstruct the true nature of the Greek revolution. The main arguments that uh, were um, recorded in this uh, publication were the following. The Greek revolution was not a clash between the Christianity and Islam, since the Ottoman Empire was also inhabited by various Christian Orthodox peoples hostile to the Greeks. Uh, the revolution in the Peloponnese and the Aegean Islands aimed at restoring ancient Greece, which was folly, of course. No such pretense had been made by in any document of the Greek revolution. Um, the close succession of revolutions in Italy and elsewhere in Europe by the Greek revolution proved the latter's ideological relation with them which was, again, uh, misrepresentation. <clears throat> Furthermore, the uh, author claimed the events at the Danubian principalities had been influenced by political lies. They did not really comply with the aims of the Philikiate area, since local populations uh, in the Danubian principalities enjoyed an almost complete independence from the Ottoman Empire. And the true grievances were directed against the absolutism of the Fanariot rulers. Um, for those who might not be able to comprehend this bit uh, of information, I'll um, explain that the, these, sem these two semi-independent um, uh, principalities uh, were under the Ottoman rule, but governed by Greeks from the uh, Greek neighborhood of uh, Istanbul called Fanari, and that's why they were called Fanariot, uh, generally. The final argument was that the organization of the revolution had involved extensively Ali Pasha of Ioannina, the famous uh, local uh, ruler of uh, Epirus and Albania, whose position had improved after its outbreak. That was a complete lie, because actually Ali Pasha had been... Um, uh, practically defeated uh, by the Sultan's troops and uh, was uh, under uh, siege in uh, his uh, fortress uh, of the capital of Ioannina. So uh, the author concluded with uh, an ominous references to, reference to the previous major revolution in uh, Greek lands, which had occurred in 1770 and was uh, known as uh, the Orlov Revolt. Uh, again said then, it is only with sorrow that one can think of the consequences of a venture calculated so badly and founded on passion and lies. The very unpleasant consequences for many thousands of Christian Greek populations arising from ventures attempted in the Peloponnese during the seventh decade of the past century in 1770 are well known. Now, let's move though to Britain. Uh, which, as I said, had uh, withdrawn from the uh, contest of the Holy Alliance, or rather never uh, joined it, uh, where responses were more cautious on the whole. Uh, the London Times reported on the 11th of April, 1821, um, uh, with an acknowledgement of the Greeks' deep hatred and despise for the Turkish rulers, along with the fact that their revolution was long overdue. <clears throat> A couple of weeks later, on the 26th of April, in another issue, the Turks were uh, uh, characterized implacable barbarians. And on the 30th of April, another uh, newspaper, The Courier, which was pro-government uh, in Britain, um, 
claimed that no one would be surprised if the Greek Revolution resulted only in words. Uh, the Morning Chronicle, another newspaper, reported on the 10th of May of 1821 uh, about uh, expressing Russophobia, which was prevalent in uh, British political circles at the time, um, mixed with the wish that uh, a way might be found for the Greek people to be relieved of Turkish tyranny. The exact uh, comment uh, was as follows. It is of importance to the liberty of Europe that European Turkey should not be annexed in the whole or in part to Russia, but humanity revolts at the idea of a people being condemned forever to a state of degrading servitude, and policy and general interests do not require any such sacrifice. And continued by stating that we are not enemies of Greek independence, but of Russian aggrandizement. Therefore, if Lond Londonderry, uh, the foreign secretary, Secretary Lord Castlery, who entertained so strong a conviction of the Russian Emperor Alexander's honesty of intentions on this subject, will only undertake to secure Europe against this danger, and he'll find it very easy to reconcile it to the overthrow of Turkish power. So the whole idea, as you can see, it's rather mixed in uh, the comments of the British newspapers. Uh, further on, the Morning Chronicle states, God forbid that we should ever recommend any attempt to prevent the people suffering from such dreadful misgovernment as that which has made almost a desert of the finest part of Europe. Uh, further on, on the 29th of June in 1821, the <clears throat> uh, tones of uh, the commentaries of the Morning Chronicle started changing. Uh, in that, on that particular day, the comment was as follows. The infatuation of this nation, meaning the Greek, becomes more evident who had built their places upon sand and though and thought to gain independence by treachery and shameful massacres, which their leaders call victories. The manner in, in which both parties carry on the contest excites indignation. It is mostly unarmed persons who are sacrificed. The Muslim and the Greek vie with each other in cruelty. And to sum it up, uh, I'll present you with a comment by fa uh, con our contemporary uh, British uh, historian, David Brewer, who said that with Cassidy as foreign secretary, the Tory government line was that neutrality meant not attempting to support the Greek cause with funds, men or equipment. A Tory Philhellen was thus virtually a contradiction in terms. On the other hand, and on the uh, greater scale, uh, there were positive attitudes vis-a-vis -vis the Greek cause in uh, the West. Um, those attitudes were based on Western admiration for ancient Greece. And they also focused on the mildness of Greek character vis-a-vis -vis Turkish cruelty. Uh, they juxtaposed Christian Greeks to Muslim Turks. And in short, uh, the Greek cause was favored by two contemporary cultural movements, strong cultural movements, classicism and romanticism. Classicism appealing, I would dare say, to uh, more or less of uh, an older, older generation and romanticism to the younger generation or the period. Now, let's start with the actual Greeks who uh, contributed to the uh, promotion of the Greek struggle uh, abroad. Uh, a well-known figure was Alexandros Mavrokordatos, who in fact was an early exponent of the Greek independence even before it had actually been declared. Who was he? He was a nephew and close associate of Ioannis Karadzas, a fanariot and former prince of Wallachia until 1812, when he was uh, removed by the Sultan and replaced by another Greek. In 1820, a year before the Greek Revolution, uh, Alexandros Mavrokordatos had authorized a political treatise entitled Coup d'oeil sur la Turquie, or in English, A Glimpse of Turkey. That um, <clears throat> treatise was never published at the time for reasons of political expediency, but it is interesting to note that a copy of it had been sent to von Gens, the uh, commentator of the Österreichische Beobachter. Uh, in this treatise, Mavrokordatos uh, argued in favor of the Greek independence by stating that Austria and Great Britain were the two main powers that could influence developments in the Ottoman Empire at the expense of Russia. 
And moreover, if Austria and Britain did not take advantage of the irrevocable decline of the Ottoman Empire, instead of trying to stabilize it, it would uh, Russia would act first and benefit uh, more than them, as a matter of fact. Let's see some particular points stated uh, in this text. Turkey was a power without an army, without resources, without means, composed of heterogeneous elements which are mutually antagonistic, whose weight in the balance of power is nil. Those who know the Greeks must be persuaded that they will again seize the first opportunity which presents itself to renew their efforts and to finally recover their liberty through any sac um, sac sacrifice necessary. Uh, fast forward a um, year, right at the beginning with the revolution, the Greek revolution in uh, the Peloponnese, where the first uh, uh, temporary government, so to speak, of uh, the um, Greek rebels based in Kalamata, the so-called Bessinian Senate, issued a manifesto addressed to Europe, which was translated soon translated into English, French, Italian, and German. Uh, it was dated on the 28th of March, just three days after the official outbreak of the Greek Revolution, and signed by the leader of the Maniots, Petro Beymavar Michalis, who was also the uh, chief of the Messinian Senate. Uh, the author or authors of this text are unknown and are uh, considered to have been either some member of the Filiki Eteria or Adamandios Korais, who we're going to meet uh, very soon, or the secretary of Mavar Michalis as such. Here we have two pictures. Uh, on the left, the original text of the manifesto and uh, a photo of Mavar Michalis on the right. Let's read uh, an extract of the manifesto, stating that the insupportable yoke of Ottoman tyranny hath weighted down for above a century the unhappy Greeks of the Peloponnese. Our bands having burst their fetters, already signalize themselves against the barbarians. Our mouths are opened, heretofore silent, or employed only in addressing useless supplications to our tormentors. They now celebrate the deliverance which we have sworn to accomplish or else to perish. We invoke, therefore, the aid of all civilized nations of Europe that we may the more promptly attain to the goal of a just and sacred enterprise reconquer our rights and regenerate our unfortunate people. Greece, our mother, was the lamp that illuminated you. On this ground, she reckons on your philanthropy. Arms, money, and counsel are what she expects from you. We promise you her lively gratitude, which she'll prove by deeds in more prosperous times. Uh, there soon followed, uh, in a uh, matter of a couple, uh, couple of months, on the 25th of May, uh, another appeal, uh, this time specifically targeted to Americans uh, and uh, entitled, um, uh, or rather sent as an appeal to the citizens of the United States, again signed by Mavra Michalis. In that it was stated that in taking the resolution to live and die for liberty, we feel ourselves drawn toward you by a natural sympathy. It is among you that liberty has founded has found her abode, and she is worshipped by you as by our fathers. In invoking her name, we invoke yours, feeling that it is that in imitating you, we imitate uh, our own ancestors, and that we shall show ourselves worthy of them in proportion as we resemble you. Though separated from you, Americans, by mighty oceans, we are drawn near to you by your virtues. We feel you to be nearer to us than the nations of, uh, on our frontiers, and we regard you as friends, fellow citizens, and brethren, because you are just, benevolent, and generous. Just you are for for just for you are free, benevolent and generous, for your laws are the laws of the gospel. Um, more to the point of the uh, uh, lecture, as such the Greek uh, uh, the promotion of the Greek cause. Uh, in Europe was undertaken by various individuals or groups loosely connected to each other. I'll uh, start by mentioning here some of the more active persons involved in this process, uh, namely Petros Epitis, Adamandios Korais, Konstantinos Polychroniadis, and Ale Alexandros Mavrokordatos, whom we've already seen. 
Now we'll see who Epitus was. He, we, we could call him a real apostle of the Greek cause. He was a doctor and scholar, a member of the Philiki Eteria, and an emissary of Alexandros Ypsilantis in Western Europe. He traveled extensively in many cities of Germany and also to The Hague, Brussels, Amsterdam, Paris, and London. All that in the very early days of the revolution. Uh, according to the Greek historian Apostolos Vakalopoulos uh, on Epitis, uh, he, uh, he was spending relentlessly his own money. He was Greece's first representative with a special mission in the West, the man who stirred up his fellow countrymen in Europe in an extensive campaign to enlighten its peoples on the just struggle of the Greek nation. However, the real mastermind of support in Western Europe for Greece, especially among intellectuals, was Adamantius Corais. He was a doctor and a prominent classical scholar in Paris, where he'd lived for quite a few decades. In 1821, he was aged 73, but still he organized in Paris a Greek committee for the material and moral support of the Greek struggle whose members became active in pro-Greek publications and fundraisings. Korais was quick to correspond with uh, various foreign uh, personalities, um, both political uh, figures and uh, intellectuals, one of uh, whom was the then president of Haiti, Jean-Pierre Boyer, who we see on the right of this picture, of this slide, um, uh, from whom Corais uh, asked for, for financial and military support. Boyer replied by regretting his inability to send financial support, but allegedly he sent a shipment of 25 tons of Haitian coffee to be sold for the cause of the Greek independence. Unfortunately, there is no way of knowing uh, whether this uh, shipment reached destination and if uh, it was actually sold, because the, there is no information, further information on the this uh, issue. Uh, in Boyer's reply, dated the 15th of January, 1822, we read that with great enthusiasm, we learned that Hellas was finally forced to take up arms in order to gain her freedom and the position that she once held among the nations of the world. Such a beautiful and just case, most importantly, the first successes which have accompanied, accompanied it cannot leave Haitians indifferent, for we, like the Hellens, were for a long time subjected to a dishonorable slavery and finally with our own chains broke the head of tyranny. Convey to your co-patriots the warm wishes that the people of Haiti sent on the, be on the behalf of your liberation. May they prove to be like their ancestors and guided by the commands of Miltiades and be able in the fields of a uh, new marathon to achieve the triumph of the holy affair that they have undertaken on behalf of their rights, religion and motherland. May it be at last through their wise decisions that they will be commemorated by history as the heirs of the endurance and virtues of their ancestors. Another significant personality with whom Corey started uh, uh, more lengthy correspondence uh, was Thomas Jefferson, the third uh, president of the United States who was an old acquaintance of him because they had both met uh, in uh, France, in Paris, uh, in the period 1785 to 89, when Jefferson was the uh, American ambassador there. Uh, in the period between July 1823 and January 1825, they exchanged four letters um, with Corais writing in French and Jefferson replying in English. In these letters, we see Corais concerns uh, about the course of the revolution. Uh, and the reasons uh, for this reason, he requested advice on Greece's state building and suggested that the US would send trade representatives to Greece. He also asked for Jefferson guidance, being concerned about the Greeks' lack of experience in self-government and preparation to address the crisis of early statehood. Um, what uh, Jefferson suggested was that on the base of his political experience and uh, given Greece's unstable political circumstances, uh, a single, not federal, government based on a system of representatives should be, um, uh, should be put in place 
uh, in the balance of the three branches of power, that this is the executive, the legislative, the, and the judiciary. He also praised the freedom of religion, the habeas corpus, the trial by jury, the exclusive right of legislation and taxation by the representatives of the people, and freedom of the press. That is all the elements that we find in the American Constitution, in which uh, were the ideals that the Americans fought uh, for during their uh, revolution. Um, he stated in particular that no people sympathize more feelingly than ours with the sufferings of your countrymen. None offer more sincere and ardent praise to heaven for their success, and nothing indeed but the fundamental principle of our government, never to entangle us with the broils of Europe, could restrain our generous youth from taking some part in this holy cause. Um, it is interesting that uh, both Jefferson and Correis shared an interest in classical education, uh, agreeing on the importance of public education and the and classics for higher uh, education as such. Uh, on the right here, the picture we see the first page of Jefferson's letter dated October 23, 1823. Another ardent supporter of uh, Correis uh, in, in particular in Greek independence in general, was Edward Everett. He had been trained uh, as a classical scholar. He was, um, uh, he was from Massachusetts. At, the, at 1819, age 25, he traveled to Greece accompanying Lord Byron. Um, the same year, he was employed by Harvard as a, a teacher of uh, classics. And uh, a year later, he appears as the editor of the North American Review, a uh, leading literary magazine. He had met Corais in Paris in 1817, and uh, in, it was in 1821 that Corais had sent him the announcement of the Greek Declaration of Independence, um, prompting ever to uh, found uh, two years uh, later in 1823, the Boston Committee for the Relief of Greeks. Uh, in 1824, as a member of Congress, he promoted aid to the Greek cause, ushering support for Greeks on university campuses and among the elite society in Boston, New York, and Philadelphia. Uh, on uh, his part, Everett uh, was influential on um, another significant American, Daniel Webster, a, law a lawyer and a congressman, also from Massachusetts, who was, uh, to begin with, a strong opponent of the Holy Alliance. Motivated by Everett, uh, Webster argued uh, fervently in favor of the Greek cause in the House of Representatives on the 8th of December, 1823. Um, and I'm reading here the concluding remarks of uh, his speech. The Greeks address the civilized world with a pathos not easy to be resisted. They invoke our favor by more moving considerations than can well belong to the condition of any other people. They stretch out their arms to the Christian communities of the earth, beseeching them by a generous recollection of their ancestors, by the consideration of their own desolated and ruined cities and villages, by their wives and children sold into an accursed slavery, by their own blood which they seem willing to pour out like water, by the common faith and in the name which unites all Christians, that they would extend to them least some token of compassionate regard. Uh, now, returning to Paris, uh, I'm going to present you with another person uh, involved, the Greek involved in this uh, uh, effort, uh, Constantinos Polychroniadis or Polychronis, uh, who was a polyglot teacher from the region of Zagori in Epirus, and who in the summer of 1821, as a member of Corais's Greek Committee in Paris, published two significant works in French, arguing in favor of the Greek cause. On the right, you can see the, on the bottom of the picture, uh, his uh, only surviving uh, uh, personal uh, feature, the, his signature. And these are the title pages of his two French uh, works, entitled the first, Consideration sur la guerre actuelle entre le grec et le turc, which uh, would translate as considerations on the war between Greeks and Turks, and the one to the right uh, entitled Notice sur l'état actuel de la Turquie, considéré sur les uh, rapports commerciaux et politiques avec l'Angleterre, which um, on my impromptu translation would uh, translate as um, uh, a notice on the 
um, uh, state the actual state of Turkey, seen through the uh, contacts, the commercial and political contacts with England. Uh, what did he say there? In the former, which was published um, uh, under the deliberately misleading initials SZ for reasons of secrecy, secrecy uh, while the latter anonymously, Polychroniadis tried to refute the arguments of the Österreichs of Beobachter and to present the Greek Revolution in a more favorable eye. Uh, let me remind you here that the, they were both published almost simultaneously with the uh, comments of uh, von Gens in the Österreichs of Beobachter in Vienna. The latter work followed in the footsteps of Mabrokordato's unpublished memorandum of 1820, which I've already presented to you, using the same layout, structure, and arguments. And interestingly enough, after September 1821, Polychroniadis appears as a close associate of Mavrokodatos, that is, removing himself from the circle of Korais, as it turned out. Um, who were Korais's French associates who uh, helped him in his uh, efforts in France? Uh, in July 1821, the Baron Auguste Prosper François Guerrier de Dumas, Dumas translated into French and published Corais's Sarpisma Polemisterion, translating as Military Trumpet Call, uh, a work which had originally been, been published in Greek in 1801 and which prompted for uh, people to take arms for the Greek Revolution, 20 years before its actual beginning, of course. In the same volume, uh, Dumas uh, uh, also published Alexander, uh, Alexander Sipsilandis' appeal to the French and Germans, pleading for their support. And a year later, after the destruction of Hios by the Ottomans, he published the lyrical poem Hios, La Grèce et l'Europe, le, Hios, Greece and Europe. And here we see the uh, covers, uh, first pages on the left of the original Greek text, Self is Napoleon Mysterion, of course, is. and the title page of the French translation on the right. Another interesting uh, case was the uh, French uh, publisher, famous French publisher, uh, Ambroise Fermin Didot, uh, who uh, had established a reputation of uh, publishing classical text. And uh, this fellow, who had uh, collaborated with uh, Corais on a more uh, business level before, in, uh, published in 20, 1825, an appeal to the French for financial assistance to distressed Greek students in France, in which he actually states that Mr. Corais, whose name and virtues are known and appreciated throughout Europe, has been assigned to distribute this assistance to Greece in Paris. Epitis, whom we have already seen before, I was also active in Paris, independently of Corais, and in the summer of 1821, while in Paris, he managed to meet twice with the French Prime Minister, uh, the fifth Duke of Richelieu, formerly governor of Odessa in uh, Russia, presently Ukraine, uh, which was a city populated largely by Greeks. How did that happen, you might wonder? Because as a royalist, Richelieu had... Uh, moved out of France while Napoleon was in power, joined the Russians and uh, been appointed by Tsar Alexander as the governor of uh, Odessa. Uh, returning to France after the fall of Napoleon, he became prime minister, as we've seen, and in the occasion of his meetings with uh, Epitis, he expressed his favor for the Greek cause uh, and assisted in the formation of the Greek committee in Paris. However, this um, his... Uh, uh, good feelings uh, did not have any results, really, because in December 1821, he was forced to resign, and soon afterwards, in 1822, he died. Epitis then appears in London, having moved there from Paris. In July 1821, uh, he tried to promote the Greek cause in Britain. In London, he had contacts with potential supporters of the Greek cause, including Frederick North, the fifth Earl of Guildford, was subsequently the founder of the Ionian Academy in Corfu in 1824. Another significant uh, contact was Thomas Gordon, a Scottish aristocrat and former army officer who later joined the fight in Greece. 
And finally, John Baring, a young merchant and subsequent chairman of the London Greek Committee, which was to play a very significant role. I'm not going to expand on it, though, uh, but just mentioning it. Uh, in the activities of uh, the Greek Committee uh, in London, which uh, contributed to the raising and the handling of the two Greek loans of independence, as they were called, sent to Greece for the purposes of the Greek struggle. The, now, this is an interesting uh, coincidence, if you like. Soon after Epictetus' arrival in London, there appeared there an English version of Polychroniades' book, the notice and so on, uh, under the English title Remarks on the Present State of Turkey. Uh, its publication was uh, probably financed by the prosperous Greek, uh, prosperous Greek merchant community of London. And it seems that it, it was a pity who had carried the French publication to London and uh, uh, contributed to its translation. Um, the other thing is that the translation was completed without the knowledge of Polychroniadis, was probably not fluent in English, as I uh, mentioned earlier. And uh, it seems to have been done by Dimitrios Kinas, whose brother, that's interesting again, was another member of Corais Committee in Paris. So one brother was in Paris, the other in London, and they both contributed to the promotion of the Greek struggle. The even more important and interesting thing is the impact of uh, the remarks in Great Britain. Uh, in combination with the Epictetus tour uh, in London, the publication of the book uh, became game changers. Polychroniadis' uh, arguments for the benefits in store for the British, if Great Britain acknowledged the existence uh, of an independent Greece, were too eloquent to pass unnoticed. And uh, as a result, uh, on the 1st of August in 1821, the Times published extensive extracts from the remarks. Let's see what the Times wrote. The Greek cause begins to have recourse to the press as a natural auxiliary. The two great powers to be enlisted in its service are the hearts of the European nations and the policy of their governments. The writer seems to aim at combining an address to the national sentiment with one to the more solid interests to the state and strive to demonstrate that by giving an active and decided countenance to the struggling Greeks, England would reap an abundant accession to her commercial greatness and prosperity. Um, now, we have to see which were the potentially receptive audiences in Great Britain for such uh, publication. One group was the political liberals, represented in the House of Commons by the Whigs and Radicals, for example, by a well-known MP, John Cam Hopehouse, a close friend of Lord Byron. Also, liberal followers of the well-known philosopher Jeremy Bentham, exponent of a philosophy of utility as a universal guide to a rational and modern system of government, totally coherent and applicable everywhere in the world. A third group were individuals from ethnic minorities, such as Scots or Irish. And finally, the Quakers. Uh, Benthamite views were apparently in accordance with Poly Polychroniadis' ideas. Since, according to Bentham's followers, support for Greece's struggle would create business opportunities with the newly established Greek government, as well as throughout the Mediterranean, as a result of the diminishing influence of the Ottoman Empire. Were, though, Bentham's views really compatible as regards the Greek Revolution? I'm presenting here two arguments, two views rather, one contemporary by Alexandros Mavrokordatos and the, the second by uh, the well-known uh, modern historian Mark Mazawa. Avrokodato said that Bentham's views were good in theory, but not in practice. While Mazo states that Benthamites were precursors of those late 20th century technocrats who found out across the globe from Europe and the US, advising governments on how to manage their people's affairs. And as we know, this is not a very uh, a good practice, uh, at least not very successful in recent years. At this point, there were also some new influences, as we would call them today, for the Greek cause, um, especially in Britain, where uh, the arrival of uh, uh, Nicolas Piccolos in September and October 1821, uh, a former member of the Philiki Eterie and an active member of Corais' public uh, Paris committee, boosted against the attempts to uh, gain support in Britain. 
but more significant English support was to be generated elsewhere. And here I'm presenting the connection between Mavrocordatos and the two famous English poets, Shelley and Byron. In the spring of 1821, while residing in Pisa in Italy, a town filled with radicals, romantics, and adventurers, as uh, very eloquently was stated by Mazova, Mavrocordatos became a close friend of the famous romantic poet Percy Shelley and his wife Mary, the famous uh, author of Frankenstein. Uh, Mavrocordatos persuaded Shelley, a political radical, that Greece was bound to gain its freedom. And under this influence, Shelley pub produced in 1822 his famous lyrical drama Hellas, inspired by Aeschylus' Perse and dedicated to Mavrocordatos. In the foreword of that work, Shelley stated the following, we are all Greeks, our laws, our literature, our religion, our arts have their root in Greece. But for Greece, we might still have been savages and idolaters. The modern Greek is the descendant of those glorious beings whom the imagination almost refuses to figure to itself as belonging to our kind. And he inherits much of their sensibility, their rapidity of conception, their enthusiasm and their courage. Uh, in August 1821, Shelley met Lord Byron in Ravenna in Italy again, and his strong Philhellenism made a strong impression on Byron. In this context, in March 1823, Byron met again in Genoa another um, Brit, Edward Blackyear, who persuaded him to liaise with the London Greek Committee and assisted in its efforts. Who was Blackyear, though? You probably never heard of him before. He was an Irishman who served with the British fleet in the Mediterranean during the Napoleonic Wars, resigning in 1820. He was also an ardent Benthamite, uh, but he became a very an excellent opponent and promoter of the Greek cause. To him, every action of the Greeks was valorous, wise and admirable, while every action of the Turks was cruel, offensive and cowardly, so much so that he would even justify the massacres of the Turks at Tripolitsa in September 1821. Another significant exponent of uh, uh, the Greek cause and uh, advocate was the famous uh, politician William, William Wilberforce, who in 1822 uh, have already been made the name of him for himself as the protagonist of the abolition of the slave trade in Britain. He commented on the Tory policy on Greek issues as follows. It's a disgrace to all the powers of Europe that long year now they have not made the simultaneous effort and driven back a nation of barbarians, the inveterate enemies of Christianity and freedom in, uh, into Asia. I know of no case in which the power of a mighty country like England could be more nobly, more generously or more justifiably exerted than in rescuing the Greeks from bondage and destruction. In January 1823, Andreas Luriotis, an associate of Mavrocordatos and the representative of the Greek government, arrived in London in order to secure financial assistance for the Greek cause. Uh, and this arrival prompted on the 3rd of March, 1823, the official inauguration uh, of the London Greek Committee, uh, which was activated in an attempt to indeed secure this loan for the Greek struggle. Uh, for the purposes of... Uh, uh, writing a report uh, on the prospects of such a loan, Blackyear was sent in Greece um, in the period uh, between March and May 1823, accompanying Luriotis on his return. And on his own return to London, Blackyear wrote a very inaccurately, not to say misleading, misleadingly favorable report on Greece for the London Greek Committee. Uh, it is interesting to note that in his own words, Blackie was enthusiastically favored to Grecian freedom, not less from a sense of religion than of gratitude to their ancestors. And it was thanks to his report that uh, Greece uh, secured its first uh, loan from uh, Britain for the purposes of uh, the war. Moving away from uh, England uh, to Switzerland, there, the Greek struggle was promoted in a slightly different context. Um, it was, of course, viewed very, very favorably in the Young Swiss Republic, which was founded only in 1814. Uh, and that, uh, and 
despite the country's poverty, forced neutrality and encirclement, encirclement by neighbors hostile to the Greek cause, such as France and Austria, the Swiss indeed assisted the Greek struggle materially and financially. The famous historian William St. Clair wrote the following about the Swiss assistance. The citizens of the Swiss cities and cantons had been the first to establish Philhellenic societies in 1821, and they were still making their regular contributions at the end. Alone of all the Greek societies of Europe and America, they continued in active existence throughout the war, continuing their own work even when the spurts of enthusiasm elsewhere had died away. Uh, as I implied before, the Swiss were motivated by slightly different um, uh, stimulations. In January 1823, 160 refugees and followers of Alexander Sipsilandis' failed movement in the Danubian principalities crossed the German-Swiss border. They had left Odessa almost a year earlier, crossing the Ukraine, Russia, Poland, and Germany, a distance of 2,340 kilometers, in an effort to reach Greece via friendly or neutral territories. <clears throat> Their torments, <clears throat> excuse me, and overall behavior sparked a wave of sympathy in every canton or city they reached. And here we have a drawing by two Swiss artists of uh, some of these figures of the refugees. How did the Swiss respond to the Greek cause? Uh, I'll present you with two views. The first from uh, the notes of Johann Konrad Troll, who said that the world keeps on forgetting that the Greeks have always been known for their great talent, diligence, courage, self-sufficiency, great intellectual mobility and ability to induce sacrifices. A people that is able to, dex to so dexterously adjust to, ad to adverse circumstances in other countries still taking advantage of them in order to continue to exist, while also, retaining, while also retaining a reputation that is meant for the sea, is certainly made for, of a nucleus consisting of positive elements. Another Swiss, Friedrich Vogel, wrote some years later that the cry of abhorrence arose everywhere on news reached us of the horrendous Turkish acts against the Greek population and partly other Christians for the purpose of suppressing the revolution. Ardent prayers for the preservation of the nation of the Greeks reached the sky, along with encouraging hopes when it became known that the Greeks had decided so strongly to so strongly uh, resist their oppressors and when the news of their victories over the Turks reached us. Uh, beyond these uh, comments and uh, favorable responses, the significant um, uh, piece of information is that the strongest Swiss support of the Greek cause was the Genevan banker Jean-Gabriel Einar, a close friend of Yanis Kapodistrias, uh, the Tsar's former foreign minister, who in fact resided in Geneva in the period between 1822 and 28. Einar assisted the Greek revolution, especially in the critical period of 1826-28, in the latter, uh, the second uh, final period. And uh, later on, after the foundation of the Greek state, he contributed to the foundation of the first Greek bank. And I'll close this tour, if you like, of uh, the West and the Greek support um, generated there by um, pointing to the connection between Korais and Friedrich Thiersch, um, a dedicated follower of Korais in Bavaria uh, and a classical scholar and university professor. The two men had originally met in Paris in 1813 and corresponded since 1817. Uh, in the summer of 1821, Tiersch wrote a series of pro-Greek articles in the Augsburger Allgemeine Zeitung, refuting the views of the Österreichische Beobachter and using Corace's arguments. Uh, more precisely, in August 1821, he issued a call for German volunteers to fight for Greece and also collected money for Greek war needs and care of civilians. By December 1821, he had drawn an organized scheme for the creation of a German legion to fight in Greece, but his plan failed to materialize due to lack of support by the Bavarian king as a result of Austro-Prussian pressure. 
Finally, in September 18, uh, 1831 to September 1832, and for practically a year, he traveled to Greece on a field trip to study antiquities. So, completing my presentation and uh, uh, in the context of a general assessment of the Greek revolutionary, revolutionary networks, I'll point to the main features of their activity. There are some negative common features of all these people, uh, groups involved. Uh, the One of them being that uh, there was an impromptu formation of uh, these networks. They were activated uh, in an originally hostile political environment. They differed in their political views and lacked an overall coordination. However, there were also some positive uh, features which <clears throat> in the end made a difference uh, in the fact that uh, the, all the networks made successful use of available means of publicity, meaning the press, publications, associations with Christianity and classical Greece, largely by exercising public relations on a personal level. I think this must have become clear now by pointing out personal levels between various persons involved in these networks and the local associates. Thus, these networks changed the originally negative outlook of Greek revolution as a subversive political movement into that of a struggle against barbarism. And I'm uh, finishing with uh, an overview for those uh, who uh, like to have a quick look of an indicative bibliography, including English works. And for those of you who can read Greek, some also some Greek uh, works. Uh, generally available uh, altogether. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm open to your questions now. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nikoloudis, for this uh, very excellent lecture. To give the opportunity to the attendees to type their questions, I will ask the first question. Mm -hmm. In the last slide, uh, you mentioned the positive and negatives of the Greek networks, networks in the West to promote the Greek revolution. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit about the negatives? Yes, <clears throat> the negatives <clears throat> um, have to do mostly, in my opinion, with the fact that uh, these were, as I mentioned, impromptu uh, responses, uh, as for many Greeks, especially abroad, the outbreak of the revolution was a sudden event. They were not uh, prepared for it, except from those who were actually involved in the Philikia Eteria, uh, and whose names are not known altogether. We just know the names of some of the more significant ones. So uh, they had to really come up with ideas and uh, solutions um, very quickly to counter the negative uh, publicity, which uh, appeared in the early months of the Greek Revolution, starting, though, from different uh, ideological uh, or political um, um, <clears throat> guidelines. I mean, uh, one of the groups that uh, were involved in this uh, process, as might have come out in the course of my presentation, was the Philiki Eteria. And actually, some of its members, like Epitis or... Um, uh, Piccolos, who were uh, closely associated with Ypsilantis and his movement in the Danubian principalities, and in fact sent by him in personally as his personal emissaries to the West to promote uh, the struggle in uh, from his own point of view. Uh, another um, influential circle, as I expect might have also come out, uh, working from a different background was the Circle of Korais. Korais was a very famous uh, intellectual, especially as a classical scholar, with a wide circle of uh, connections, uh, both in France and abroad, uh, which he motivated with a close circle of um, uh, associates, including Polychroniadis in the beginning, um, trying to uh, gain support, as I mentioned, in the US, Haiti, uh, in France as such. Uh, and uh, through his associates in um, uh, other parts of the of Europe, uh, I would say that this was probably the most influential um, group altogether, in the sense that it uh, 
spread out to many countries and uh, many different uh, uh, people of many different backgrounds, politicians in the States or Haiti or intellectuals such as Thiers in Germany and so on, or even uh, all the uh, different groups in England, uh, which were not uh, connected by, in anything but their uh, disapproval of the conservative government and its uh, oppressive policies. Uh, a third uh, influential uh, person, of course, who played a key role again in uh, Britain, uh, perhaps more so there than uh, Korais or Polychroniadis, was Mavrokordatos, because he had um, realized, uh, as we saw even before the beginning of the Greek Revolution, that England would be the key country uh, to assist in the Greek struggle. Uh, because of all these groups, which are um, indigenous groups, I mean, in Britain, which uh, had a strong motivation for, uh, for such uh, a project. As it turned out, uh, the, the process was slower in Britain than in some other countries. Uh, it didn't start materializing until late, in, late 18, 1823, early 1824, when Byron, in fact, became the frontman of the Greek uh, Committee of London and uh, took up the uh, task of uh, coordinating the Greek uh, Committee in London uh, as a carrier of the loan with Mavrokordatos in Greece as a representative of the Greek authorities. Um, the Greek loans as such were a disaster uh, in terms of their results. They created more havoc uh, because of people trying to take advantage of it uh, in Greece than they actually assisted with um, uh, the Greek cause, the, the development of the Greek struggle. But as it turned out, uh, they forced, in a way, the British government under the guidance of Canning, really, not Castlery, who had committed suicide in the summer of 1822. But Canning, who was a Tory politician, but a more, more open-minded, if you like, uh, was the key man who saw the benefits for Britain, for the British government, in um, uh, breaking the uh, connection between Greece and the Ottoman Empire and pulling Greece into a British sphere of influence in the Mediterranean. Uh, so it was Canning, in fact, uh, who acted uh, on his own initiative in July 1827 that managed to um, have France and Russia signing the July Convention, as it's known, which led three months later to the Battle of Navarino. Uh, and it was, again, a very uh, fortunate coincidence because only a month after this uh, convention, uh, Canning died suddenly. So he, he didn't even live to see the Battle of Navarino. But nevertheless, by this series of... Uh, uh, unplanned, if you like, events, uh, the whole situation worked out very positively for Greece in Britain, which was the key, uh, the, the cornerstone of uh, the political um, environment in Europe and the key ally, potential ally, that eventually drew, of course, as I said, France and uh, Russia to the, uh, towards the benefit, uh, to benefit the Greek cause. Thank you. Uh, there is a comment. The Greeks of India in Calcutta raised money for the Greek struggle, which appeared in the London Press in August 1824. So I don't know if you're aware of this. That's a uh, I wasn't aware of this. I, I'm not surprised, really, because Greeks uh, raised money everywhere uh, abroad, from um, what I know. Um, the, the thing is, who handled this money? And how? Um, uh, we I don't think there's any exact uh, calculation of how much money was raised over the years, uh, the decade practically of the Greek Revolution and uh, spent in Greece. Uh, many people went broke, even Greek um, tycoons of the time, um, like the Kundiliotis family and so on, uh, who dedicated their fortunes uh, to the Greek cause. But uh, the thing is that uh, money wouldn't uh, make the final difference if it wasn't for the political uh, manipulations. 
and uh, I think it was the uh, the manipulation of politicians, especially in Britain, that made the the difference. May I may I also add here, if I uh, can, that um, France was also a late starter, if you like, in uh, uh, in Philhellenism. I mean. There were individuals from France who also went to Greece because there was a memory of Napoleon, the Republican ideas, and so on. And uh, more significantly, there were um, former officers of the French army who joined the Greek struggle. But the French uh, monarchist government was very uh, 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 restrained in uh, its um, views of the Greek cause because. France was really under supervision from the Holy Alliance. Uh, it had uh, the old uh, monarchy had been restored, but the uh, the regime was not very stable. And we know that in 1830, right at the end of the Greek Revolution, there was also another French Revolution which uh, brought down the king of the time, King Charles II, and uh, sorry, yes, and replaced him with uh, another person in the throne. So uh, it was only, and in fact. An interesting thing is that Chateaubriand, the famous uh, poet, who was the equivalent of Byron in Britain in terms of his uh, uh, intellectual appeal to the French uh, public, uh, who was also um, um, minister in the Fre- foreign minister in the French government between 1822 and 24, and he was very reserved. He didn't want to openly support the Greek Revolution. However, when he was uh, removed from power in 1824, he changed drastically his views and he came out openly in f- uh, favor of the Greek cause and significantly contributed significantly to the uh, Philhellenic movement in France, which became more evident after the fall of Messalonghi in 1826. So you see you have different stages from one country to the other, which um, uh, put them on the map uh, in the uh, whole extent of the Greek revolution. Uh, of course, Greeks are always in the background, as I said, Greeks of the diaspora, but uh, it's very difficult to f- find the exact um, connections and the particular contributions, the individual contributions, if you like, of each one of them. Uh, and uh, the the time, uh, uh, the exact timing that uh, they appeared. Uh, I don't see any other question. Uh, let me ask another one. Uh, do you have any idea how long it would take it would take at the time to communicate from Greece with England or the United States? How long it would take for a letter from Greece to go mm. to London and then a response to come back? And then if we talk for the United States, I suppose it would be much, much longer. Yes, I would agree with you definitely about the United States. Um I don't think there was any direct connection between, uh, even in terms of correspondence between the Greek authorities and uh, the United States for the simple reason that, as we know, because of the Monroe Doctrine, the US uh, government didn't want uh, any uh, direct involvement in um, any European affair, political affair. But of course, news spread um by letter and of course not always by the mail but uh usually through uh, personal uh, contacts i mean Corais would hand his letters to people he trusted to carry them uh, abroad uh, that was the one of the means that we know that uh, the ideas the greek ideas uh, uh, spread out there was also another obstacle that in the early years of the revolution, uh, one of the measures that the Holy Alliance took to block the uh, spill out, uh, let's say, of the Greek revolution elsewhere was by uh, blocking all the European ports to uh, Greek uh, to Greece. I mean, there were no, uh, there was no way that Greeks. Uh, could uh, travel to Europe or vice versa, Europeans travel to Greece, but for one exception, the port of Marseille. And this is interesting because, as I said, the French were not openly Philhellenic uh, right from the beginning. 
but for some reason they turned the French government turned a blind eye into the for the into the use of Marseille as a point of contact, and that's where the first field Hellenes from all countries embarked to come to Greece and how Greeks communicated um, with uh, continental Europe. So um, there were those kinds of obstacles as well, apart from uh, the political uh, blackout, if you like, or the uh, news blackouts that uh, the hostile uh, regimes of Europe try to establish. Uh, you mentioned in the writings of Mavrokordatos about the state of the Ottoman Empire at the time uh, just before the revolution, that he said that uh, the Turks, they have no army. Uh, what did he really mean by that? Well, of course, it might have been an exaggeration, a verbal exaggeration, but as it turned out, the Turks really didn't have... Uh, uh, reliable army. I mean, uh, we know from the course of the Greek Revolution that um, until really the uh, Egyptian support uh, uh, came to Greece, uh, to uh, I mean, the allies of the Turks, the Egyptians, with under Ibrahim Pasha, uh, the Turkish troops, as such, the Ottoman troops, hadn't uh, managed to suppress the Greek Revolution. Uh, and in fact, the most uh, reliable troops the Ottomans had at the time were Albanians, not uh, Turks as such. Uh, they were the, the ones who were fighting the Greeks because they had a similar way of uh, uh, fighting, like guerrilla fight and so on. Uh, but they as such could not uh, suffice to suppress the Greek revolution. So the, the Ottoman sultan called the uh, Mehmed Ali, the governor of Egypt was semi-autonomous and asked him to send his troops. Why? Because uh, Mehmed Ali had uh, uh, organized his troops on European standards. He had also hired French officers, ex-Napoleon's uh, uh, officers, who organized his uh, army. So the, the, the Egyptian army was a more modern one and uh, following the European tactics. And that's why it was more successful in 1825 when it landed on the Greek mainland in um, largely suppressing the revolution in the Peloponnese. Of course, in the end, he also suffered uh, from not just casualties, but also diseases and so on, which were prevalent at the time, uh, not just among foreigners. Let me say here, for example, that Polychroniadis, uh, who came to Greece, also died in 1825 out of a disease in Napoleon. He caught the disease. Uh, so um, it was really hard for foreigners to adjust uh, fighting in uh, Greek mainland because of the climate, because of the type of war, uh, because of the hygienic conditions, uh, and so on. Uh, and that's why perhaps the, the war lasted so long, uh, apart from any other reason, uh, because there was no way that uh, it could be decided on uh, uh, one battle or two, like, say, in the continental Europe with Waterloo and uh, so on in the Napoleonic Wars. It was a different set of circumstances altogether. Okay, we have another comment by Terry, who had a previous comment, says Metternich was probably the greatest opponent of the Greek War of Independence. Yes, that's a, that's a fact. Yeah, but even Metternich, at some point, uh, I think around 1824-25, had to, uh, at least on paper, concede to some kind of Greek uh, independence. Uh, there was an original scheme, which was not put into action, um, in which Metternich, uh, uh, which Metternich approved of, of um, creating... I think three different uh, autonomous states in uh, the area of Greece. One would be Epirus, the other one would be the Peloponnese, and the third one would be, I don't remember exactly, I think uh, Macedonia or Thessaly, something like that. Um, that didn't come to fruition because the war was still going on and um, Britain was not fully involved at the time uh, so as to force its own 
views on the other countries. Uh, but, um, uh, okay, Metternich was against it. Uh, but another interesting thing is that Gens, who was his right hand, kept on having contacts with Mavrokordatos, despite being um, political enemies and on the different sides of the political spectrum. They had um, uh, some kind of uh, communication and appreciation for each other. So, uh, you know, things are not just black and white, uh, as we may, may want to believe. Uh, there were backstage maneuvers and uh, plans which didn't uh, come to fruition, as I said, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> okay, you have a question from Peter Potamianos. Hi, Peter. The question is, when do you see the, con the confiscation of Hellenic antiquities? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. So, uh, when do you see the confiscation of Hellenic antiquities? He means like the Parthenon marbles and other uh, antiquities yeah. who were taken from Greece to England, yes. uh, other parts of Europe, etc. So is, does the question imply when were they taken and under what circumstances? Or... When, when and possibly the circumstances, yeah, possibly. Well, of course, these uh, happened all before the Greek Revolution. Uh, the the latest development in this series of removals of antiquities uh, was uh, the removal of the Venus de Milo, which is in uh, Paris, in the Louvre Museum, which I think took place in 1820, uh, very close to the beginning of the Greek Revolution. Um, and that was not, again, just an uh, one-off incident. It was a series of uh, pressures and uh, maneuvers and manipulations by which the uh, French frigate, which was sent, as a matter of fact, from France officially, managed to actually remove the statue and take it there by bribing and uh, uh, pulling muscles, if you like. Uh, Elgin was much earlier. He started in 1804 and uh, the removal of the Parthenon marbles lasted for... Uh, many years, until 1811, if I remember well. Um, it wasn't, again, a one-off incident. Um, there was also the removal of the affair marbles in Egina, uh, which was done by a group of two Englishmen and two Germans uh, under the guidance of uh, Robert Cocker, a famous architect and classicist of the time. Uh, they, again, bribed locals and... Uh, managed to remove them quickly and auction them uh, in Malta, where uh, the King uh, Ludwig I, the father of King Otto, bought them and removed them to um, Bavaria. Now, you may want to ask me, how is it that if King Ludwig of Bavaria, who was contemporary of the Greek Revolution, was so keen on uh, the Greek antiquities, how could he not uh, assist the Greek Revolution more openly? Because, as I mentioned at some point, he was also uh, under pressure from uh, the stronger neighbors, uh, Prussia and Austria, who forced him to suppress any uh, liberal uh, activities in his country, or at least keep them uh, under tight control so that they wouldn't expand and uh, influence other German states. Uh, but of course, in his case, we could say that the marbles that he uh, moved to Bavaria worked in Greece's favor in a more direct sense, in the sense that um, uh, they contributed to his uh, sympathy for Greece and uh, his acceptance to send his second son, King, uh, the subsequent King Otto, as a king of Greece. So, uh, well, of course, you may say that also the Elgin marbles acted in that uh, context as well, but. Uh, not so obviously, I would say. Not at the time, at least. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the Greek uh, Phanariots were administrators of the same autonomous regions in uh, Moldavia and uh, Lachia. Yeah. Uh, how did it turn out to go that way? Uh, that uh, process had started about a century before, um, because of some uh, revolution of the Romanian uh, elite, let's say, uh, who sided with uh, Russians. There was 
a constant uh, set of wars between Russia and Turkey in this area, the border area, which was the Danubian principality at the time. Uh, and at some point, uh, the port, the Ottoman um, government stopped uh, having any confidence on the Romanian um, archons and uh, uh, the Romanian elite. So they replaced them with Greeks, uh, Greeks from Istanbul, Constantinople, who were Ottoman subjects and uh, who had already worked in the framework of the Ottoman government. So they were more reliable. And that's how they established themselves. But of course, they were not uh, there for life. They were uh, their, um, their terms were renewed or stopped according to the wishes of the Sultan. And this was a case, for example, of Karadzas, the uncle of Mavrokordatos, who was removed in 1812 uh, as a result of the last Turk, uh, Russia Turkish war before the Greek Revolution, uh, because he had shown sympathy for the for the Russian. Russians. So he was removed. He left and followed by Mavrokordatos, his nephew. He moved to Geneva, from there to Pisa, and that's where the whole uh, set, uh, the group was set and uh, organized. Um, and he was replaced by other Greeks, but there were only four Panariot families uh, in the last years before the Greek revolutions who were authorized by the Sultan to um, keep these offices, uh, the two uh, thrones of uh, Moldavia and Wallachia, uh, and uh, Karadzas was not one of them, the Karadzas family altogether, or the Mavrokordatos in, as a result. So, uh, you see, the, there are some kind of uh, coincidences which also play a part in the development of uh, uh, things. Very good, thank you. Uh, Stefanos, I don't see any other questions. Do you see anything from the No, I don't see anything Facebook side? from Facebook. But I had a question myself. Okay, go ahead. Uh, were there any similar efforts by the Ottomans themselves to influence the Western public opinion to their favor? Definitely not. Because the Ottomans started from a different point of view. They had this arrogant belief that uh, they could uh, uh, rule their countries as uh, autocratic rulers, the sultans, without considering anybody. And uh, uh, that's how why they lost. They had lost the public opinion uh, struggle in the, from day one, um, let alone the practices they followed, uh, like uh, slaughters and massacres and all that, which was the only way they 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 knew on uh, how to suppress any uh, revolution or uh, individuals that were acting against them, so um, they, their reputation had preceded them in that uh, context. And uh, the the critical point was that the Greek Revolution would uh, present itself not as a liberal movement fighting against. Uh, a monarch, which was what the whole of the established of the uh, establishment, the European establishment, abhorred. But uh, as it turned out, uh, that it was a movement of uh, people who were fighting for their uh, independence from uh, an empire which was alien in terms of European uh, principles, Modern. because of religion, because of uh, political practices. Uh, because of uh, intolerance to any kind of uh, disagreement and so on. Uh, so the moment they managed to spin, let's say, the public opinion in this direction, uh, and um, which they did fairly early, apparently, as I said, it seems that right from the summer of 1821, uh, public opinion had already started actively uh, expressing itself in favor of the Greeks at least on a day-to-day -day level of the uh, of the man in the street, if not the elite. Uh, so the Ottomans, they were just, uh, I think they could not really understand why this thing turned around in the way it did against them. Uh, and that was obvious as late as 
say the Battle of Navarino, the Russo Turkish War of 1828, when they still insisted on having the final words, despite the fact that everyone else had turned against them. I mean, even the, the European uh, establishment. So, yeah, that's uh, that's my view on the <laughs> on this. I have read in a book, in a Greek book from a Greek professor, that um, after the revolution started, the Sultan had proposed to slaughter all Greeks. Is that, are you familiar? Yes, apparently the, he had this idea, uh, but uh, <laughs> I don't remember who was that uh, convinced him otherwise. It would have been uh, the worst mistake he could have done. Uh, of course, we know that he slaughtered Greeks. Uh, the Greeks were slaughtered in uh, Constantinople. Uh, the patriarch was hanged as a complicity to the uh, outbreak of the revolution. We know that um, the people in Hios were massacred despite the fact that they hadn't openly revolted en masse and so on. But all these events turned out to be uh, a public opinion stance for the Greek cause. Because uh, they immediately uh, turned the uh, mm -hmm. the public opinion uh, openly against the the Turkish uh, atrocities. So again, in a way, uh, it was a set of uh, uh, circumstances, uh, coincidental circumstances, which contributed in one way or the other to the promotion of the Greek cause without uh, real effort in in, the, in this context. I wonder if there are any any Turkish voices today that uh, might accuse the Westerners of uh, under No, no, uh, quite the contrary. As a matter of fact, there have been uh, books and publications by younger Turkish um, uh, historians. Uh, I can mention a guy called Sukru Ilicak, who has published um, uh, a set of two volumes uh, of Turkish documents uh, in... Uh, well, I think the one volume is in uh, the original texts, uh, the original documents, and the other one is in English translation. You can find them online because they have been published, uh, they have been sponsored as PDF uh, volumes by uh, foundation. I don't remember, but I can find it out for you if you like. And he, uh, he has produced all the set of uh, documents which discredit, of course, the, the Ottoman Sultan at the time. And let it be uh, heard at this point that, interestingly enough, Mahmoud II, the sultan in charge at the time, was not one of the most oppressive. He, as a matter of fact, he was considered a rather progressive sultan. <laughs> he was the one who dissolved the Janissaries because they had become a state within the state uh, by overthrowing sultans and uh, uh, creating a, a regime of their own. So he dismantled the Janissaries indirectly assisting the Greek struggle because they were supposed to be the most uh, uh, elite the core that the Ottomans had at the time. Quite the opposite, in fact. But on paper, they were the more elite troops. By dissolving them, he ended up without having any real means to fight the Greeks. And that's why he had turned to uh, the Egyptians for assistance. So, uh, yeah, the, the Ottomans were not really prepared either ideologically or militarily to face such uh, a revolution. They, they would, they, the only uh, revolutions they had uh, um, come across that far was local revolts, which they could suppress sooner or later. We have the example, for example, of the Serbian revolution, 1805, uh, which was suppressed. Uh, they gave autonomy to the Serbs, and that was it. The Serbs didn't uh, uh, revolt again for quite a few decades, um, and so on. There were local topaks like Ali Pasha, for example, who would uh, become semi-independent, and they, the, the port could not suppress them either. Uh, there was a time when Ali Pasha controlled the whole of Greece and Albania, either directly or indirectly, with his sons as local governors. Uh, and that was not the wish of the Sultan, but he could not or did not wish to uh, upset the balance, either because many people in his uh, court were bribed uh, to keep silent, or because he didn't have the means. Um, anyway, the Ottoman Empire, despite appearing as a coherent state, was 
ideologically uh, backward, let's say. Uh, they hadn't kept up with the Enlightenment. They, uh, they could not understand it because it was out of the framework of the, of the Muslim mind of thought. Um, let's not forget that the Sultan was a caliph as well of the Muslims all over the world, and so on and so forth. So they were not, uh, as I said, they were caught off guard uh, in every sense, if you like. Uh, so uh, that's why things turned out as they did. Okay. Very good. I will close with a last comment by Terry. Thank you for highly informative lecture. Professor Kostadin Haji Dimitriou has written a book on the US on the US role in the Greek War of 1821. That was his comment. Yes, and in fact, uh, he, uh, Professor Dimitriou has uh, uh, also has created a website with uh, documents concerning oh. the Greek uh, American uh, contacts, Jefferson, Corais, and so on which personally I found very convenient because it has ready translations of the Greek texts that I mentioned. Uh, uh, I would like to thank uh, your viewer for his compliment. I hope that uh, I have done my duty, <laughs> so to speak. Thank you very much. Uh, we will close.